Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. In this week's special episode, we do a five-part interview series all about our recently concluded event called ZK Hack. This is the project that dominated the last few months of my life, and it was a pretty exciting feat. So ZK Hack consisted of weekly workshops and puzzle-breaking competitions. Between weekly events, the hackers hacked. With a team of four, we produced seven weekly events, six puzzle hacks. We had two partners who built the puzzles with us. We had six workshop hosts, 16 sponsors and some awesome prize sponsors as well. In the end, 38 hacked a puzzle, and 1,200 people signed up for the newsletter, and over 2,500 people signed up for the workshops. And yeah, in this show, I interview some of the most active or successful hackers and workshop participants, as well as the puzzle builders and partners. And we wrap up with part of the ZK team looking back on what worked and what we aim to do different going forward, because the ZK hack doesn't actually end here. The plan is to definitely continue this, to start doing more events in this direction, and grow a unique community of its own focused primarily on zero-knowledge learning, ZK research, and onboarding more people into the space. Overall, it was a lot of fun. It felt like a really nice way to w- wrap up the year. And I don't think I'm alone in thinking that you know this coming year for ZK is going to be very, very exciting. But I am also very, very tired right now as you may also be as the year comes to a close. And so I won't be releasing a full episode next week. I will likely be back in two weeks with a full episode, but I'm also going to play it by ear. Don't worry, though. Come the new year, we will be rolling again, exploring topics and themes that I hope, yeah, you'll want to explore with me. So before we start in on these interviews... I want to first of all let you know about the ZK Jobs Board. There's some fantastic jobs there. If you are looking for a new opportunity in ZK, that is a great place to check out over the new year. I also want to thank this week's sponsor, Private Storage. Private Storage, a private, secure, end-to-end encrypted storage solution, is currently preparing to launch version one of the service. It's created by Least Authority, a leader in the security of distributed systems. Private storage uses privacy and security by design principles to ensure users have greater anonymity and assurance that their data is protected. Its features include end-to-end encryption, a zero-knowledge access pass payment system, and accountless authorization. No one, not even private storage, can see user data even when it's being stored on their grid. Visit the website private.storage and register to be notified once the service is launched. So thank you again, private storage. Now, here are my interviews all about ZK Hack. So I'm sitting with one of the participants of ZK Hack, Gershta. Welcome, Gershta, to the ZK Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. So I really wanted to have you join us on this ZK Hack wrap-up because I think your journey is so exciting. Tell us a little bit about kind of maybe where you first heard about ZK Hack and what your kind of intention was with the event. I decided to start learning Solidity in September. Privacy is something that's really important to me. So I was immediately drawn to the ZK space. I started listening to the ZK podcast. Um, So it's crazy to be on here after having started there. And I heard (laughs) about ZK Hack. And then independently, a good friend of mine also sent me the link to ZK Hack as this might be something you'd be interested in. So um, I signed up as soon as I saw that it existed. Very cool. And when you first started ZK Hack, had you done any any sort of ZK work? Had you worked with any of those tools before? No, not at all. I barely knew what Snark and Stark stood for. <laughs> that was <laughs> the extent this. of my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're one of the folks who actually went through each of the workshops as I understood it. Like, did you, did you go to all of them actually? Yes, I went to every workshop. I did every puzzle. I at least attempted the reading connected to every puzzle as well. And I attempted, uh, attended all of the Thaler study groups. Very cool. Yeah, because one of the community members, Tor, put together this Taylor. Actually, can you explain what this is? It's a book. Yeah. So Professor Justin Thaler wrote a manuscript that is essentially on um, zero knowledge proofs and sort of all of the background build up to those, uh, how all the math comes together and fits together with cryptography. And so 
It was recommended in the very first event as a great resource. I think Alessandro is the one who recommended it. And so after that first event, Thor tweeted, anybody want to do a study group around this? And yeah. we started doing it. And then he actually got in touch with Justin Thaler, who has now been showing up at the study group. So it Which has been I absolutely amazing. <laughs> That's yes, so cool. Me too. <laughs> you, you have the author there to ask all your questions. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Okay, so then, so you've done all the workshops, you did all the puzzles, and I think what's very cool is, like, despite having started sort of from scratch, you not only did the puzzles, you actually submitted a few of the puzzle write-ups with the solutions. We actually were hosting a competition for every week. We would pick one of the puzzle submissions as kind of the one we would use on the website, and you won two of those. So tell me a little bit about, like, maybe how that worked. Like if you were so fresh to this, was it very, very hard to write these up or did you actually find that helpful? It was helpful for cementing the knowledge. I had decided beforehand that if I managed to solve any of them, I would do a write-up for every one that I could solve. Um, so I didn't succeed in solving the first two puzzles. I tried really hard. I read and studied for two weeks on all this new stuff that I'd never heard of before, right? I was learning about elliptic curves and pairing-based cryptography and field extensions. And I never really studied group theory and linear algebra. So I was trying to catch up on all of the foundational Whoa. stuff from those. <laughs> It was really intense those first couple I bet. of weeks. Was the Thaler book really helping on that? Like, was that giving you a lot of that insight or did you have to go outside of it? No, that book is way beyond the level that I was at. So it was actually just an extra thing to do. So it actually just like packed more in on top of it. Damn. <laughs> so it's an incredible resource, but it's not necessarily useful if you're starting from where I was starting. But so at the end of those, I got to puzzle three, week three, and... I had, I had had a good intuition with the first puzzle, but wasn't able to solve it. With the second puzzle, I was totally out to sea. I sort of understood parts of it, but I couldn't bring it all together, even sort of intuitively, let alone actually coding it up. So by week three, I was sort of going, maybe I won't get any of these, but I'll just try to get one by the end. So I was working away at it. I started, I kind of had the intuition on it but then just wasn't bringing it home. And in the end, I ended up solving it Monday morning. And I was so excited. I couldn't believe I'd gotten it and uh, immediately started writing my write-up. I, I had to do other stuff that day too, right? So I couldn't spend all day writing the write-up. And I ended up, um, I ran out of time to finish it and I had to just click submit. So it, it went in at like 11.59. And when it won, I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. <laughs> um, well, I guess you had yeah. finished it enough. <laughs> the COVID enough. liked it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The one thing I would have liked to finish doing there was to explain how we knew that the final hint was true. And so I sort of just made this leap in the inside of the puzzle right up and and then wrote up the rest of it. And there's sort of more to dig into there in a, a future life. But yeah. Cool. But uh, just to our listeners, the puzzles and the puzzle solutions are actually on the zkhack.dev website in the puzzle section. You can read those. You also won the fifth one, I think, the puzzle write up for yes. that one as well. By that point, this is now five weeks in. Uh, how are you feeling? Were you starting to get the hang of it? Yeah. So that was actually the first puzzle where the puzzle was on a subject that I had already learned about. Nice. Um, so that was really <laughs> satisfying. I mean, I don't think you can get five weeks into learning about ZK and not know what the Fiat Shamir heuristic is. So I did have that under my belt at that point. So it was a different sort of approach for that puzzle. And I was really, I felt like I covered everything I wanted to cover in that, in that write-up. I was able to sort of say, here's also how to fix the protocol. And, you know, here are some extra details that are interesting. Nice. And so what's next? What's coming up for you? You It's actually, it was seven sessions, I guess. Seven sessions with six puzzles. What do you plan on doing now? I guess you're going to keep learning or are you going to start building something? Well, both. That's That's the plan. The plan is to keep learning and also start building. So thanks to uh, motivation from you, I did <laughs> submit a Gitcoin grant. I was planning to build a project anyway. Um, and so I put it up on Gitcoin. I was looking for something that's sort of bite-sized, but would really get my hands dirty with a lot of different aspects of this stuff um, that I've been reading and learning about. So I decided to do a ZK version of the game of Mafia. So I put that up and I'll be doing that. But at the same time, I do plan to continue kind of doing targeted weeks that I thought that worked really well to have like this week we're learning about elliptic curves and this week um, we're looking at Planck. And so right now I'm doing kind of a week on Starks. I'm just like going through the Stark tutorials that are out there and building Stark proofs is my sort of background project for this week. And then I will, nice. there's so much to do. So I'll find some other ones and, and try to keep kind of, kind of going like that. 
Well, I hope you do uh, like continue to share what you're finding, because I know so many people have asked the community. They've put notes in, in the chats kind of like, how do I dive in? How do I how do I get involved? How do I learn this stuff? And it's it's been tricky to point them in a direction. I think ZK Hack was an attempt to create at least something that we could like experiment with and see if there's something to it. But I, if you're doing kind of these deep dives, if you keep sharing that, I think people will really appreciate. You might get some folks who just sort of, yeah, join you. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, because I think it can be very intimidating, right? Most of the people doing the puzzles are actually like incredible cryptography researchers at many of totally. these other projects, which I didn't realize until I saw like, oh, Ramada, you know, won. And also he's the cryptography researcher at Aztec um, <laughs> or William is over at, you know, at Polygon. Like that, that was really cool, but there's a way that you can feel as somebody who doesn't really know anything, you could feel locked out unless you're like me, you're just going to bulldoze your way through it. But what's really cool about this space is that everybody has seemed really welcoming and accepting of like, if you are interested in this, then we're interested in having you here. Um, And I think that's really cool. And so it's like, you put in the time, you try to learn it, you do your best and you just show up. And um, I will post the, the things that I'm working on learning and anybody wants to join me, everybody start somewhere. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing with us your experience with ZK Hack. And I hope to see you at the next one. We will be doing more of these. So yeah, hope you'll be there. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely look forward to it. I will be keeping my keeping my eyes on, on the Twitter and everything else for it. <laughs> Sounds good. Cool. So next up, we have Inokenti Sanofsky, also known as Ramada888, from the Aztec team, and William Barjo from Polygon Zero. Welcome both of you to the show. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, glad to be here. Okay, so the reason I wanted to have you both on was that in a way you're both like the top competitors in the puzzle competition. Inokenti, you're the one who won overall first place. You ranked every time. But William, you came in first more often in these puzzle competitions. And so I'm just excited to have you both on to talk a little bit about the ZK Hack experience, what it was like for you as puzzle hackers. And maybe we should say, like, you're both already pretty experienced cryptographers. So I'm very curious to hear what you made of this exercise. But starting off, I want to hear a little bit about how you even learned about ZK Hack. Where did it first cross your radar? Maybe start with you, Inokenti. Uh, so... I regularly listen to the Zero Knowledge podcast. Actually, it was one of the first podcasts I started listening to in general because I really wanted to learn something more about cryptography through them. And at the time, I think it was the only podcast available uh, that dealt with cryptography. I really liked your 100th podcast with Dan Bonet. Dan Bonet, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I learned about ZK Hack there. I was also uh, at Aztec at the time. I also heard about it there afterwards. But uh, I was really interested in the challenges because I am somewhat new to the zero knowledge space, and uh, I wanted to try them out to learn more than to compete. Cool. What about you, William? Yeah, I'm also a big fan of the podcast. I think that's the only one I listen to, actually. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> this is so and... nice to hear. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I'm um, subscribed to like the the ZK Mesh also, and I don't know like how I got the the ZK Hack mail first, but like first time I saw it, I was like, I have to participate. I mean, I, I really like puzzles, and um, I work in the zero knowledge space, so like, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, actually, I wanted to ask if either of you had done CTFs in the past, if you had done ca- kind of capture the flag math competitions or anything like that. Maybe give me a little bit of a background there. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm. Uh, I've always loved puzzles. I also have like, uh, I did the uh, physics Olympiads when I was in high school. Okay. Uh, I do a lot of, uh, you know, math puzzles, competitive programming. And CTFs are actually like how I got started in, into crypto, like the, ah. the crypto category in CTFs. Yeah. Cool. Was there any examples of CTFs like that? Like, are there kind of annual CTFs or like regularly held ones that you would recommend to people? Um, I'm a very bad CTF player, right? So I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm probably not the, a good one to answer that. But like, you know, there, there's like a few very well-known CTFs like DEFCON or like the Google CTF, uh, which are very hard, but like you have a, a very, very nice crypto category too. Cool. And what about you, Ino Kanti? Uh I come from uh, a cybersecurity background, not from mathematics or physics. Uh, and I was a reverse engineer in the past. But so then I really started 
to get interested in cryptography more and more. And I actually came to the CTFs through Matazana Crypto Challenges. Mm. These are the challenges that anyone who was interested in applied uh, cryptographic decks at the time that everyone tried to solve. So because uh, this was the way to learn practical cryptographic security at the time. Nowadays, there's this crypto hack. Uh, website, uh, which has lots of various challenges and everyone is trying that and everyone is uh, learning this security there. Uh, but at the time, this was the de facto standard. So you had to mail your solutions to the MetaZone guys so uh, that they'd give you the next set. Cool. So tell me a little bit about how you find maybe ZK Hack different, because I know that like in the planning of it, this is really was Kobe's part. We I didn't work at all on the puzzles. It was all his idea there. But I know that even as he was designing it, it was clear that it was distinct from the CTFs that were maybe more common. So yeah, can you tell us a little bit about how this one ran, how it would be different from a CTF? There are uh, big differences. Obviously, the time scale is uh, the largest one because in a CTF, usually they are held for 12 hours, 24 hours, maybe two days. Uh, and over the weekend so that any, everyone is accommodated and everyone can start uh, solving them from the start. But there are lots of challenges. You can try and uh, take different approaches. You have the time to to apply yourself to the various parts of the puzzle uh, to, and to various puzzles here because uh, you had only one challenge that you had uh, to wait for, this was a completely different experience because you really needed to put all your effort into solving this particular challenge as fast as possible. There was no kind of approach of trying to go over all of the various challenges uh, in a regular CTF and trying to solve the easier one first. Uh. You had to go straight for it. So I think that's uh, the biggest difference. Are CTFs usually organized? Like you sort of said, they're like a 48-hour period, but is there ever a series of them where you would do like two in a row? Or is that usually the full event? Because we really did it like we were doing it on a weekly cadence. So yeah, I'm just wondering if you've had any experience like that. No, there can sometimes be parallel CTFs, but uh, I think there was only one time when uh, it wasn't me who was solving them, but uh, the guys from my team were solving first Insomniac, uh, which was held during the night. And uh, uh, then they went for one of the Chinese CTFs, uh, which was held on the next day. And without actually sleeping, they had to go for it because this was an online phase. Yeah, But that's not usually the case. William, you kind of ranked, you came in first on, like, I think most of the puzzle competitions week to week. I think, it, was it like four out of six or something? F four or five, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about how those puzzles were. Maybe give us a little bit of a rundown of some of the topics that were cool or new or, yeah, how did, how did they flow for you? To me, they were really interesting because they were very close to the stuff I work with every day. So like those are like zero knowledge protocols and there's always uh, a bug in them or like a mistake in the in the math. And so that's like totally different from like in most uh, crypto puzzles, there's like something weird or you have to guess like the mistake, but like here it was very real world. So like, for example, the first one was uh, BLS with a Pedersen hash. And I mean, that's the kind of mistake I could have done, right? So like, okay. you, you, you need a hash to curve function and you use Pedersen, but yeah, it's, uh, it's not secure. There was also one about uh, Fiat Shamir, the Fiat Shamir heuristic. That's also a mistake I could have done, right? So you don't initiate it with the, um, I don't know, the, the number you have to commit, uh, I think, if I remember correctly. So yeah, I think it was very different from a, a typical CTF in that way. But there was one week where, I, can, I don't know if you mind me asking, but there was one week where, did you have like trouble with one of the puzzles? Was there one that was exceptionally challenging yeah. for you? Yeah. <laughs> don't want to put you on the spot on that, but I... There was yeah, one where you didn't definitely. come in on the first three and we were like, what? <laughs> yeah. So um, so I think, yeah, the, the solution to that puzzle was uh, you had two vectors and two nonce. And like uh, the second vector was the double of the first one and the second nonce was the double of the first one. And for some reason that never crossed my mind. <laughs> and so it was a big hint in the, in the puzzle title. It was double trouble. But yeah. <laughs> I never thought of it. And so uh, I think Susanna posted a hint on Friday and I saw the hint and I was like, oh, okay, Th then it's easy. <laughs> uh, 
And Okente, which, like, maybe can you give me a little bit of, like, your thoughts on the puzzles? Which ones were exciting to you? Which ones maybe didn't work as well? To be frank, all of them were really interesting to me just because uh, they were new. And especially with CTFs, it's quite often the case that uh, at least the easy or medium tasks are just reiterations of uh, something you've seen in the past. It's it's quite rare for completely new primitive, for completely new protocols uh, to be used in CTFs or something, well, out of the ordinary. And here, because it's the ZK space, all of them were in the zero knowledge space, and it's a rare space to be part of a CTF. So that's why it was pretty exciting. And most of them were maths based. So they had some logic uh, in them. Like, for example, the Pedersen hash problem was uh, the linearity. There was the blinding challenge also was about linearity. So uh, these things, they, I really liked uh, such a mathematical CTF because quite often in CTFs, you have uh, an issue where uh, there's some broken primitive, which is knownly broken, uh, and you have to uh, apply this attack uh, this known attack, uh, but it's a rare case that you have to think of something yourself, think of uh, the attack or uh, recreate the attack yourself without searching for it. So that was really nice. Cool. Was there any puzzle that would be your favorite that you would like highlight of the six? I, I mean, I really loved the Pedersen Hash one. I really didn't like how long it took for me to solve uh, the one with the Fiat Shemit, uh, Shamir transform because I, I just didn't couldn't spot it f- uh, fast enough. Okay. I think uh, the one that I didn't uh, like, but it was a decent puzzle, but uh, the one that I didn't like, apart from the double troubles um, guessing part, was uh, the uh, group dynamics one because it was... It's kind of classic, so there was there was nothing new to me. I already had part of the code that brute forced part of the solution. The only uh, thing I had to do was change the code to work on twists, because it, it is rare to use uh, pairing curves uh, for this type of CTF task. Got it. On the last puzzle, there was like a second, kind of an extra bug, a bug that kind of revealed the bug. Um, did you both spot that, or did you notice it more in the chat? Yeah, I, I spotted it. Oh, you spotted it? Yeah, so like I, I solved the puzzle the intended way, I think. So like there's this paper by uh, Ariel, um, yeah, which is like very uh, detailed on how to break the puzzle. And so I did it the intended way. And then to debug, I changed the parameter in the code to see if like if everything worked correctly. And like I changed the parameter and then the puzzle still worked. And I was like, okay, something, something fishy is going on. And then oh, no. I, I figured out there was a bug and like one uh, parameter of the setup, I think was zero where it shouldn't have been. And so, yeah, I, I used that in my solution actually. And then Kobe messaged me on Discord saying like, are you sure? Are you sure about your solution? And I was like, yeah, I think there's a bug. Uh oh. And you know, Kenta, you didn't catch this one. You you just solved it straight. No, because I tried to solve it as fast as possible the straight way. So I went for it and, well, try, just tried to apply the paper by Ariel there. Got it. But yeah, there was a chat. I mean, I we saw that. I mean, I think it was spotted at least publicly. Someone mentioned it about 20 minutes, 30 minutes after. I think they solved it by chance. That was the funniest thing. That they, <laughs> really? they just submitted the, the a different proof and it worked. <laughs> yeah, so, so that that's actually the fun part because if you if you create the proof as intended, so like to to recap the the puzzle, you 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 had to cheat on the public inputs, right? So like have a proof that proves like wrong public inputs. But like if you put as inputs the right public inputs, then the puzzle like would succeed. So it was quite easy actually to solve it, even if you haven't uh, seen the paper. Okay. Is there any last thoughts you want to share about ZK Hack? Any wishes? Any recommendations? I think you mentioned that you wanted to uh, to plan a, a in person ZK Hackathon, and so yeah, I'm uh, I would be totally down for it. Like uh, I think it's a great idea. I think we we have like quite a still a small community. So like I think there's like 500 people on the Discord, and so like we have, we still have a, a small community. And so, like, it could still be, like, great to, to meet in person and, like, hack together. Yeah, I also fully support an offline uh, hackathon because, well, meeting others in person is, uh, I think, would be more important than anything else during uh, ZK Hack, just 
getting to know so many talented people would be great. If, however, it was it had an online part, I think moving it to uh, a weekend would be great because people uh, in uh, particularly unfavorable uh, time zones would be able to take part in it then. Uh, right now on a Tuesday at uh, 6 p.m. UTC, I don't think Japan is It's taking part in this. Yeah. That's a really good point. I think time zones with, with uh, online events are always a tricky one. But I like that idea. We could also potentially alternate times. We could like do them on, you know, one would be earlier in the day, one would be a bit later to give a little bit more balance. I like it. Cool. Okay, well, I want to say thank you to both of you for coming on the show. Thanks also for hacking. And congrats on both of you in your own way kind of winning. <laughs> you got, both of you got NFTs because you made it into the top 10. You also got some other prizes that uh, I hope you are going to check out, going to find in your wallet. But yeah, thanks again. Thank you for organizing it. It was pretty nice. Yeah, thanks for having us. So next up, we have Joshua and Joe from Anoma. Anoma was a partner on ZK Hack. The team at Anoma actually worked with Kobe to build the puzzles. So yeah, welcome Joe and Joshua. Hello. Thanks for having us. I want to ask you both about how it kind of worked for you internally. Like, did you both build all three or did each of you take one and run with it? Uh, we each built one puzzle along with our uh, colleague, Simone, uh, who built one of the other puzzles. Um, and we pretty much worked independently on each one. Cool. Tell me a little bit about how the ideas came to be. Like how, like, I know that there was a group where there's a lot of discussion about how, like what these puzzles should look like. What was that early part of it like where you're designing them out? Uh, we discussed a little bit amongst ourselves about what kinds of puzzles would be interesting. And uh, certainly Kobe had some ideas. Uh, there was a lot of overlap. Uh, we uh, came up with several puzzles that were too close together. Um, <laughs> so we had to go through several rounds of uh Uh, creativity before we settled on on some puzzles that we thought were interesting. But um, Kobe certainly uh, had some suggestions as well, and that helped us uh, zero in. Did you feel like as you were building them, could you tell how hard or easy they would be? Like, were you like, this is going to be a hard one when you'd release one? I can say that I definitely did not. I was completely unsure if this was an easy problem or a hard problem. My problem was something that I had been looking at for a while, so it kind of came easy to me, and I wondered if it would be easy for other people as well. When I told Kobe about it, he thought it was a good puzzle, so I just uh, accepted that. Um, but yeah, I had no Which idea. Which one was that? Uh, I did uh, number four, the um, Hidden in Plain Sight. Tell us a little bit about that puzzle. What what was hidden in plain sight? What was that focused on? Uh, yeah, so that puzzle has to do with uh, blinding um, polynomial commitments. And um, uh, you have to be careful with how many blinding factors you use. Uh, it depends on how many times a polynomial is opened. The more times you open it, the more blinding factors you need to use. So that puzzle, there was an insufficient number of uh, blinding factors used which allows someone to make a um, system of equations, which can then uh, be used to test a guess at the um, uh, whatever information is trying to be hidden. Uh, in, in that puzzle, there were a thousand um, accounts, which were the data that was supposed to be hidden. And so um, there you have a, a thousand guesses and uh, for each For each account, you can you can check to see if that account is the one that was blinded. Okay, but what was the bug exactly then? Like, what was the exploit? It was to to show that you could actually guess it if you wanted to. Yeah. yeah. How would a hacker actually show that? Um, by uh, picking out the uh, the account that matches the uh, the commitment. But if it was broken, could someone also just try each one until they got that one and still not submit a code? <laughs> like, no, not submit actually a solution? Uh, yes, you can. Um, I mean, that's how you solve it. You you try each one until you get there. But uh, the the part that is um, that is the actual solution is is showing this uh, this system of equations um, being solved. 
you can't just uh, guess straight away. You have to go through this extra process of uh, deriving the, the blinding factors. Very cool. Okay, Joe, when you did your puzzle, could you tell if it was going to be easy or hard? Sort of, um, because we had discussed with Kobe before about um, he he had really uh, been excited about doing something based off of the uh, Zcash proving system or right uh, yeah. the BCTV fourteen proving system. So we we kind of knew going into it that um, if it was going to be based off of that original uh, proving system bug that um, if someone is familiar with the proving system already and familiar with the bug, then it would probably be relatively straightforward. And uh, if someone went through the, the reading for the puzzle and you know understood all of it, then it would be easy for them. But if the person had not been so familiar, then it probably wouldn't be so easy. Um, and so designing it, uh, um, it, it felt a little bit like, uh, designing a homework problem. Um, it wasn't, uh, it, uh, it's very difficult sometimes to decide, uh, how easy or hard a homework problem is going to end up being. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but we, we felt like if someone had done the preparation that it would, it would just end up being very straightforward. It didn't require very much creativity at all. So that was the one where there was sort of a double bug, eh? Yes. yes. <laughs> Can we let's chat about it? Yeah, um, I, this, uh, it? It just shows how difficult it is to implement these uh, these proving <laughs> systems correctly. Yeah, it um, it, it had uh, a soundness bug, which was based off of um, what we had intended to plant in it. Um, but it also had a soundness bug, which was just an implementation error, just a coding error, which wasn't even necessarily a bug in the proving system. It was just a, uh, it was just a bug in the, how the uh, proving system processed its input. And ah. um, there's, um, uh, if uh, you're familiar with the puzzle or familiar with the proving systems uh, in general, there's the step where you transform constraints into polynomials. And um, the step, well, fairly standard, um, was missing some, some important bits. And, uh, this uh, resulted in it ignoring certain inputs um, under certain conditions, certain conditions being the ones that happened in the puzzle. <laughs> but at the same time, like, do you think this hurt the aim of the puzzle being a puzzle to show you and explain to you kind of how easy these bugs could be or where they could be? Do you think that there, it almost had like an, a meta education to it? It definitely did for me. I mean, uh, you know, it, 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 I think it demonstrates, um, you know, when you remove the usual care and uh, caution and, and um, thoughtfulness that you should have when you're writing um, cryptography code, uh, when you remove all those things, um, then this is how bugs like this can happen, right? Yeah. Um, that uh, you wouldn't want your... Uh, the person building your airplane to be doing it uh, at 1 a.m., you know, uh, <laughs> after they've done, like, their, they've built all their regular airplanes for the day and they're building, like, this extra, you know, extra special puzzle airplane. Yeah. Um, no, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't want that. You would want uh, every time you're building something to, uh, to be uh, careful in its construction. You want to be, have multiple rounds of... Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, different people looking at it from different eyes, make sure there's nothing uh, obvious missing, um, different layers of testing. Like all of these things are, are um, designed over many years, uh, many years of experience to um, know how to prevent bugs like this from, from like sneaking into code. Totally. Joshua, would you have wished that you could have actually hacked on the hacks? Because that was something maybe to note. I don't know if we were super overt about that, but the building teams weren't really allowed to participate because, you know, they knew stuff. So, but when you were watching this go down, were you kind of like, oh, I wish I could do one of these? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I say this is if we're doing an extra, Z if we're doing a new ZK hack in the new year, uh, maybe we... If we have a different building partner, maybe you get to. Ah, uh, yeah. And it would be very cool to be on the other side potentially. Uh, I thought the um, the the other puzzles that I, I was aware of were uh, pretty interesting, and I none of them did I like know right from the bat like how to solve it. So I would have enjoyed having the chance to uh, to take a crack at some of these. Nice. Did you get a chance to see any of the other kind of events and things around ZK Hack? 
What was your overall impression of it? I, I thought the the concept was really, um, really nice to have. I mean, there's just not very many events and materials in this space. I, I think this is kind of a, um, I, I don't want to say a niche area of cryptography because it's it's becoming big, but but certainly I think there's uh, you know uh, like a very small amount of materials. Um, I know that on Discord um, they're discussing Justin Thaler's book. That's just an example of you know, how how few like textbooks are available for this sort of totally. thing. And I think uh, um, people are piecing this stuff together from blog posts and miscellaneous papers. And um, there's there's uh, uh, certain lack of unifying view of, uh, of the entire thing. And so I think having these workshops and uh, hack contests did, did a good job of bringing a lot of people together into one space with one sort of unifying theme. Cool. I agree. Uh, I'm mostly self-taught in this area. And the, the materials that I had to work with were academic papers and uh, completely untechnical blog posts. <laughs> And there wasn't much of anything in between, uh, which would have been a nice uh, stepping stone through the through the material. Um, so having something like this, I think, is uh, is really cool. I mean, that's a question that keeps coming up everywhere: is this idea of like where to go, what resources people should check out. Do you have any any recommendations? Maybe today, like what you're saying back back when you started, there was nothing. But do you think that there are some other like resources people should try to check out? Well, um, Justin Thaler's book uh, that Joe mentioned, I think, is a good is a good one. I'll just uh, plug some articles that I wrote a while ago. Um, <laughs> sure. I did a, a series called uh, Plonk by Hand, in which I uh, I take the uh, the Plonk protocol and literally go through it a step by step by hand in pen and paper. Cool. Uh, kind of to show that it's not as um, uh, spooky as it it seems uh, to do this math. It can be done. Uh, it can even be done by hand. Uh, although I do kind of inadvertently show how uh, just how complex even a small example could be. Um, but uh, you can find that online if you just, if you just search Plunk by hand, it should come up. Yeah, we'll try to also add that to the show notes um, so our listeners can find that out. Well, cool. So thank you both for coming on and sharing with us your experience of ZK Hack from the perspective of a builder. I do hope that you are at the next one, either as builders again or potentially as not, if you want to actually get a chance to be hackers. And uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thanks so much. So next up, I'm here with Errol, head of education at Alio, and Alex, CEO at Alio. Alio was also one of the partner teams of CK Hack. So we worked with Alio to actually build three out of the six puzzles, like the Anoma team. Alio was our other partner. So, yes, I want to say a big welcome to both of you to the show. Thank you very much, Anna. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it was a great pleasure to uh, participate. Thank you, Anna. Looking forward to the discussion. I want to start this a little bit with you, Alex. It was, I mean, you know kind of where ZK Hack started way back when. I mean, we're talking, what was it, like August that we started this conversation, yeah. I think? September? So, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it's been amazing uh, to see it grow into what it's become. Totally. And so Alio joined as a partner team building puzzles, much like Onoma, the previous guest. We actually talked with the Onoma builders. But can you tell me a little bit about what it was like from the Alio team to sort of do this? Like, what feedback did you hear about this sort of puzzle building team? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think the team really enjoyed it. And, you know, specifically on, you know, on, on our side, you know, we have Pratyush uh, Mishra, who's a cryptographer from Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley. And, uh, you know, he has a, an, a an academic background. And, and I think for him, it was a lot of fun to kind of create puzzles that were educational, right? I think it's it's a it's a an applied way of learning this space, and it's fun. I think for both to make the puzzles, but also to see people solve them. And so I think that for us was really, really kind of there's 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 kind of a two parts uh, of fulfillment for for participating in something like this. So it was really cool. Mm hmm. In this space in general, like, do you feel like finding talent or maybe training up talent is like a bit of a challenge? <laughs> 
I feel like oh, I'm asking a very obvious I mean, question here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks for the uh, yeah layup. Appreciate it. No, uh, <laughs> no. The, yeah, it's 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 everybody. You know, I think every everybody listening to this podcast who's certainly who's at a at a company in the space. You know, I think knows that the struggle to find people who uh, you know are no, no more talented, but also I think it's just just knowledgeable to a basic level it is difficult. And I think this is one of the great things. Look, by the way, besides you know zk hack, I mean this is one of the the important things that I uh, an important service that like this podcast provides, right? And and kind of the other stuff that you work on, Anna. Uh, and others as well throughout the space who kind of contribute this a community-owned repository of knowledge, if you will, that people can kind of pick up and, and get up to speed in the space. But I, the thing that I think has never been done before that ZK Hack is really breaking ground on is, you know, the podcast is sort of a passive exercise, right? I sit, I can mm -hmm. sit, you know, hang out with my kids, listen to a podcast. But here is it's an active, the, the requirement is to actively think about what, these concepts and what they mean, but also apply that knowledge in something very real. And, you know, I think that's that's a much more effective way to learn and teach. And I think, you know, as we've seen, there have been people who've gone from zero to hero effectively in the span of the seven week ZK hack, which I think mm -hmm. is amazing. And so, um, yeah, so I think it's, it's great. We had one of those people on in this episode, actually. Yeah. Someone who used it as, yeah. as a boot camp. Um, Errol, you hosted the Alia workshop. So you were one of the workshop hosts doing, we did this weekly cadence every week, a new team introducing new tools, new concepts. Kind of how did you approach that from, from your side and putting together a workshop like this? Yeah, it was interesting to, to think about. There wasn't too much communication between the different teams to try and coordinate and make sure we weren't overlapping a lot of the content. And it was a dif difficult decision about whether to just, you know, focus on on the programming, on introducing a compiler language, Leo, and, and teaching people how to use it, or doing a technical deep dive or some balance between them. So we just kind of looked at the technology and, and try to think about what kind of people would be there and what would be most useful to them. And we try to find a balance between seeing some cool cryptography and how it works, but also why it's relevant and then bringing in the, the the compiler language to discuss, you know, how to use it and and when to use it because I think this is something that was missed a little bit before. Mm. That's actually that's a really good piece of feedback and something that like I would take with me this idea that making a connection a little bit between these workshops like we really did just go workshop after workshop. We kind of we we saw some teams do some things, other teams do other things. We weren't really giving any sort of program. But do you think that would have been helpful actually if we had like had structure? Or do you think it is good to sort of let the teams present the way they want? I think in an ideal world you want some structure. But right now things are kind of already everywhere and it's yeah. difficult to find that communication. <laughs> and it's like this is where we want to go, right? And hopefully we'll get more into this. But you need to build communication between the different teams and also understand the space a little better to decide what to present when. And this is still a big problem. All the people, really smart people who are making the new protocols, they're so busy trying to implement them and make them faster and better that they have less time to teach everyone the important parts of them. And there's this gap that we have to bridge now. So, yeah, Errol, I thought, you know, you know, obviously it was the Alia workshop, so I'm maybe a bit biased, but I thought you're, you know, I've presented a lot in the space and seen a lot of presentations. And I thought you did a really good job of uh, capturing the audience's attention and kind of bringing everyone along with you in a narrative. And I guess with something as complicated as this subject, I mean, it's, you know, crypt cryptocurrencies alone are kind of like a whole thing, right? And then you have compilers thrown in there and then zero knowledge cryptography, I guess. Like, how do you prepare? How do you think about structuring education when there's that much ground to cover and making it accessible for everybody? I, I just, you're curious how you approach that. Yeah, it's, it's a very difficult thing. Um, fortunately for me, I also learned the stuff along the way. Like I come from a mathematics background and I didn't know too much about compiler languages. And so when I was learning in the few months before, I was asking myself all these questions and I tried to take note of the things I understood and didn't understand and what I thought might have been useful to know earlier on. You had this this idea of like the larger ecosystem. This is kind of where I want to take this part of the conversation. It's like the larger ecosystem and education and onboarding more people. I mean, the goal with what we did was definitely to like do an experiment to do that. But I want to use this time to sort of explore how we could potentially do that better. So one idea was better communication, maybe between the teams. I think one of the challenges there, too, is that there are actually different approaches. There are different DSLs. There are different... Yeah 
you know, schools of thought. There are different even academic programs or teachers or labs where a lot of these people are coming out of that might have, you know, their own sort of different perspectives on what, how things should be done. And so I do wonder, like, the concept of a standard has sort of been brought up a few times in the ZK space, but also pushed away because it's like, oh, it's too early to do standards potentially. But yeah, I, I am trying, I'm trying to think of like, how are there ways for us to get a little bit of a baseline knowledge so that we can actually just at least give people a chance to find some resources that actually lead them towards working in the space. And that it's not that they're always like funneled into only like one team's, you know, curriculum. Yeah. And I, I actually think, you know, I think, I think standards for an industry are important and it, it sort of is a you know, symbolic of how much an industry has progressed. But I think, I almost think for ZK Hack, my personal view is, uh, and this, and this platform, my personal view is, is that's, that's almost the opposite of what you want. You don't want to, you don't want to make it a stamp, like a one size fits all kind of path. Mm -hmm. I think it's the diversity of ideas and opinions is kind of one of the beautiful things about this. And I think one of the, one of the risks of trying to become a standard bearer is that, of course, every individual project or team, A, wants to be the standard, B, is going to be upset if they're not. But I think, but look, I think the reality is, and I think even the most competitive people in the space um, would acknowledge that, look, I mean, it's very, very early. And just, Anna, I know in the amount, in the span of time which you've had the podcast, I mean, think about how much the space has evolved. It's incredible. I know. And these ideas that are completely, you know, that started out as kind of just at discussions like and now they're they're you know they've been implemented and I think it's amazing and I think and and having that a, a place to explore all of these different approaches without a competitive framing is really great and I think that's something that really will do the most for bringing more people to the space that's my belief although I think a little bit of competition like the puzzle competition also helped you know like I think if it's just purely like actually if we had done just a 7 week workshop series, I don't think it would have had the same feeling. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't think it, I don't think it would have been as exciting for people. From the participant standpoint, I think the participants, the, like the active participant, I think you learn more than a passive participant. So I definitely think like, you know, the fact there's a competition and the participants are competing, I think is great. But I don't necessarily think, at least to me, like having those participants compete in as diverse an array of challenges, uh, I think is great. Mm. So maybe that's what I'm getting at. Are there any other places or industries, this may be a bit to you, or like, uh, do you have sort of a bit of a vision for how we could actually develop sort of education in the space? So, and I agree like with you, Alex, ZK Hack maybe doesn't need to be like the ZK Hack event the way we did it is pretty cool the way we did it. But like maybe we can, as part of this new community, also start to create some of those resources or start to build a little bit around it. Do you have any thoughts on like how this industry at this time could do it, maybe based on other things you've seen? I think there's many perspectives you can take on this. And there's kind of two learning routes we want. There's the first learning route of teaching people what the technology does and what it can be used for. Not how it works, but just why it's relevant. You know, mm. what's, what's the difference between MENA or Alio and Ethereum? Many people hear about SNARKs, but they don't actually know really what it means. But they, they see that there's something cool there happening. And that's like a smaller amount of work to recognize the, the value of it. But then there's the other big thing happening in the space of all these new companies with all this funding, they want builders. They need people who understand the cryptography and can build the circuits and their proofs. And this is a very large barrier to entry because generally speaking, it's going to take at least six months to learn all these things. There aren't yet university courses where you're going to learn all the re required tools. Most people come from two backgrounds. That's either like a mathematics background, in which case they don't know the computer science or the coding or the computational complexity, or they come from a uh, computer science background, in which case they don't have the prerequisite maths. And in order to bridge that gap, it takes like six months. And these companies, they're just saying, we want people to build the, these things, but they're less willing to say, we'll bring on somebody for six months and teach them all the stuff, and then they'll be of use. So they're all fighting each other and trying to offer massive salaries to, to bring them on board. Like those, that small pool of people who can do yeah. both, I guess. Yeah. Right. And there's this gap in the middle. And then you, because of the dynamics between companies, of course, they kind of want to work together, but some of them are also competing. And then so pooling resources to, to build all this educational content is a difficult kind of political problem. 
And mm. I, I think ideally we want some kind of course, whether it's six months or, or a year where people can learn all these things and then we can shoot them off to companies where they'll be useful. I mean, I know there's there's projects like OX Park and that's a grant based project, but they're actually running like a curriculum. It's a very, very small cohort. Like they're doing a very like thought out, planned educational path with a group of people. Um, but I also heard that they were like crazy oversubscribed to use <laughs> crypto lingo. <laughs> but like like there was just a ton of people trying to get into that and they actually didn't have the capacity to do like a massive course. O- obviously, like I'm so excited to to find out from them what and I hope to get them on the show next year actually to talk about this. But like I want to find out what their learnings were from that to understand if there's things that we could help from this side to contribute to. I think like this conversation is kind of circling around one of the biggest problems here. I think you you've kind of mentioned it, but I just want to reiterate it. This idea that like in terms of content there is this very high level, very blog posts, like super kind of it's like ZKPs are cool and they're special. Where's Waldo? Like even like sometimes like the the shows that I've like when I've talked about ZKPs, that's usually what I present, like the very kind of high level story. And then you have the densest academic papers you can imagine. And that's those are the sort of two options. And so when you see like a list of the best CKP resources, you're usually getting something like that. You're getting very high level concept descriptions and then deep, deep, deep papers. And there's not really the bridge between them. I don't know that we solve that, but I'm curious if you're if if this is sort of the paradigm you're thinking of and like how do we fill in that middle? For sure. I think that's a really great framing. I mean, in order to get to the six months training where we're built, um, getting people to become builders, it's going to be very helpful if they have an understanding of why they should go down this route. And I, I think maybe one of the best places there is to, you, like this format is a, is a podcast and it's been really, really helpful. But some people, it's very useful to have like a visual format too and to make mm-hmm. videos where we explain the things in a, in a different way. Because some people listen to podcasts, but sometimes you don't, you know. I spent a year listening to podcasts because I was commuting. And then when I stopped commuting, I stopped listening to podcasts. But sometimes, you know, on a Sunday, I'd wake up and just watch YouTube for a little bit. So it's there's different areas in life where people will, will watch or listen to one medium, but they won't do another. And the medium's also different. If you can see something compared to just hear it, it can help there. So I think if we start making some videos, explaining some of the mathematical ideas, whether it's recursion or proofs, and then also discussing real world things like the the companies, Alio, and how we're different to other companies and and what they do. Because there are currently YouTube channels which explain a bit of this stuff, but they also, generally speaking, have like an investor mindset too. Their real question is like, should I buy this coin or not? But that's mm. not the focus we want, right? We want the focus of how does this technology work and what can we do with it? Yeah. I find it funny that like doing this podcast for the last four years, not like over four years, has been my kind of learning journey into blockchain, into zero knowledge, into all sorts of things. And yet, actually, I know for myself, like only hearing is the worst way for me to learn. <laughs> like I don't retain as much as I as I could if I had a visual or if I was writing notes like that, those are the things that actually I know for myself, I, I learn better from, but I found it very fun and challenging. Um, I think it also might make me a better host because I like forget and have to ask the questions again, you know, <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, there's kind of this myth that we have different learning styles, like one person's an auditory learner and one person's a visual learner, but this isn't really so much true. It, it's more that for different mediums, you should learn it in a different way. Like if you're doing geography and want to talk about where a country is on the map, you don't just like say it to the person, you know, you don't just say you're an auditory learner. I'm going to tell you where this place is on the map. <laughs> it's a very yes. you know silly idea. You'll, you'll just get the map and show them because it's much more effective this way. And I think a lot of these mathematical ideas and computational complexity ideas, if you visually represent them, it can help a lot with the understanding. Like whenever mathematicians talk to each other, if they don't write it down, it's just kind of forgotten immediately mm. because there's so much to, to hold on to and we overload our working memories. It's just a bad kind of medium. And don't you think there's almost something, to me, when I when you talk about this, it makes me think of like the potential for the visual representation of some of these mathematical concepts could be incredibly beautiful. Like they could look so cool, yeah, you know, so and, cool. and I mean, already you see it a little bit like, I mean, we've seen like 
generative art. And we like we obviously math can do cool shit, but like ZK math specifically circuits. Couldn't there be really, really compelling ways to present these that would also help people remember them and remember and get into them and be able to like classify them a little bit in their own minds? I, I think another fantastic educational resource specifically around mathematics that I think a lot of listeners to your show would be familiar with is three blue, one, one brown, right? And three oh, blue, yeah, one yeah. brown is, you know, it's so exactly <laughs> what that channel is, right? It's about taking these abstract mathematical ideas that maybe you're exposed to in, in school and then visualizing them and making, you know, to Errol's point, it's about kind of matching the, you know, the, the teaching style to the subject and, and, and it's a medium, the visual medium is just one where I think you can do a lot of really cool and interesting things teaching this subject. So um, yeah, that's something that I personally would love to see more of in the zero knowledge space. Yeah, massively, massively agree. The software 3 Blue, one brown uses is now public, like anybody can use it. But it's been hard to find animators because, you know, there's not that many people doing it. I think one of the key things is that the people who really understand the topics deeply, uh, the, the, the proof systems, they don't really have time to, to learn how to animate. And, you know, th this is why they're not making those videos. It's the same reason why 3 Blue, one brown is there, right? Why didn't other people who understood the topics make those videos themselves before? And it's this video creation is, is actually quite difficult and takes a lot of time. And unless somebody's focusing on it, you're not going to get these videos come out. And this is why we want to go down this route a little bit to help create this visual content that will help so much. I think there's a there is a way... As long as the industry stays vibrant into the new year, let's see how the bear, bear bull market is going. But if there's still funds, if you if you look at the way funding has evolved in ZK, especially recently, it's been wild. Like really, really, there's a lot of excitement around zero knowledge stuff. There's a lot of desire to fund things, even do grants. I guess I don't know if you'd call them these grants, but like, you know, a lot of these teams are actually like dedicating huge amounts of money to fund and to develop a zero knowledge community, maybe on their own network, what have you. But I feel like there's parts of that that could definitely go towards something like this if someone wanted to to run it. So like this idea of visualizing some of the ZKP stuff is something that we're pursuing at Alio, and like we've given or we're getting ready to give a grant for someone to animate in kind of hopefully a three blue, one brown like way. Some of the stuff in Arrow, you know, maybe can say a few more words about that. But that's an initiative that we really, really believe in. And by the way, if there's anyone out there listening to this podcast who has, you know, skills as an animator and is interested in helping with this, definitely reach out to us um, on Discord, um, or I can get, I can leave an email for you in the show notes, Anna, and, and, you know, we'd love to consider you for a grant because we view this as like, you know, it's obviously good for Alio, the company, the more people who know this stuff. But again, I think this is really, really important for the industry. And, and that's, that's really what I care about in the context of ZK Hack is because the potential of this technology is so real and so huge. And really, it, in my mind, is really only held back by the fact that not enough people understand, not, not how it works at a deep level, but, but how it works enough to know what you can do with it. And that's what I think we need to educate more people on. I also do think timing is really good for this because right now, and we, I've said this, I think, earlier even in this episode, but we are seeing the tools to build ZK stuff really coming online for the first time. Where, I mean, there have been tools for a while, but they were extremely hard to use. And it was a very small subset of people who could actually onboard themselves into those tools. But when you get into a place where the actual programming languages that can touch snarks are a lot simpler and a lot more familiar, similar to maybe things that other people are you know, used to, and yet they are interacting with snarks, but they're not forced to like dive as deep into the like circuits and, and the, you know, parameters that like a more sophisticated, you know, cryptographer could use. But someone who's actually just trying to hack something together to get an MVP wouldn't need. Um, this is where I think we are really at a moment where we're starting, just starting to see that happen. And it's very, very exciting to me. Because, you know, the dream, and I've said it already, the dream of ZK Hack is to also one day do a ZK Hackathon. <laughs> and so far, it's been really hard to think of what that would even look like. And now it's starting to seem more real. Definitely. Totally agree. I think many of us believe in when we're building these L1s, one of the main points of the L1s is so that people can build useful services on top. And people can't build the additional services on top if they don't understand the value of it and how to use the tools. So if we're not 
helping explain this to people and we're not trying to make tools that it's making it easy for them. You know, if they have to learn cryptography to make a tool, not many people will do it. If we're not doing that, we're kind of doing ourselves a disservice and, and making our L1 slightly redundant because we're making something great, but not telling anybody how to use it. it that's not a pragmatic solution. It's not a pragmatic goal. Yeah, I think you're right. Do you think the fact that we've been forced into an only online context for so long, do you think this is like good or bad for the way that we're onboarding people? Because I have to say, like, the fact that we haven't been able to meet in person to do something like a hackathon, the type of collaboration that you know happens, the way teams are formed. I mean, you can do that in an online context, but yeah, I'm just curious if you think that that has hindered or helped I mean, ZK is also super, super technical. So maybe it hasn't been a problem. Maybe it's even like helped people focus. I'm sort of on the fence myself here if it's like, if you need the in-person in a digital ecosystem. I think being online for the last year, I think has been a great thing for ZK. And I'll tell you why. I think before when everything was in person, I mean, I think I think you more or less had clusters of this knowledge that kind of were around individuals that occupied physical spaces, be they in universities or be they at companies. And I think it just, te you tended to get the people who onboarded onto the space were kind of at or near one of those physical clusters. And I think because everything is, has moved online sort of by default, like it's leveled the playing field such that you can get totally new people with like that has no barriers at all to accessing some of this expertise, yeah. right? And and it's I think that to me, and, and I think what people have realized, and I've certainly realized, is that man, there's the the latent talent of so many people out there, and the latent curiosity of so many people out there is just so both surprising and amazing and incredibly encouraging, and uh, you know talent and interest. And so I think that to me has been just one of the great things about having to be only online. And I definitely think, you know, I, I hope to, that the world kind of returns to more in-person events at some point too. But I think this aspect of, you know, how we've we've lived our lives and, and how we've operated in the last two years, I think that that part is great. Cool. Earl, do you have any last thoughts on the education question, on ZK education? C concluding remarks about education is is that it, it's, a, it's a massive problem that is relevant to all of us and it's going to take some time to to build these courses and to build the content. So the quicker we can get started and informing people and building communities around it, the better our, our industry is going to do long term and the earlier we can start seeing more real world impact. Mm, sounds good. I think we're all on the same page for this. Thank you so much for coming on the Zero Knowledge podcast and doing this sort of ZK hack wrap up with me. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. It was, a, it was a pleasure to be on today, and it was a pleasure and an honor to support this initiative. So thank you for letting us be a part of it. Massively, yeah. Looking forward to see what we do next. So to wrap up this series of interviews, I wanted to bring on my co-organizers for ZK Hack. Here on the show, I have Susanna and Tanya. Welcome, guys. Hey. Hi. So Susanna, what, why don't you tell everyone what you work on so they can get to know you? Yeah, so since May, I've been working full time for Zero Knowledge Validator, kind of doing operational things, doing some events, general running of the business in a kind of small company setting. So kind of everyone's doing everything. And before that, I was doing a PhD in bioprinting. So absolutely nothing to do oh, with crypto. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a pivot, but um, yeah. <laughs> nice. And what about you, Tonya? So I just joined the Zero Knowledge podcast team in September, and I know Anna and ZK Summit from Berlin. And yeah, for ZK podcast, I'm producer of the show and uh, work on some sponsorships and events. And for this particular event, it was actually a co-production between the Zero Knowledge podcast and the Zero Knowledge validator. And so actually we brought Susanna, Tanya, plus Kobe, to the mix and that kind of rounded out the team that put together ZK Hack. Sadly, Kobe could not make this interview and it's a real bummer because Kobe was sort of the inspiration at the beginning and I, I do hope that um, if I get a chance over the next few weeks, I will try to do a bonus episode, like a short bonus interview with Kobe about ZK Hack because I think, yeah, he's kind of an important key person. But Kobe's focus was primarily on the puzzle part, which I think we've covered somewhat in this episode. What we worked on was much more of the organizational, operational running of the thing. 
so I kind of want to do a quick throwback to like August. Yeah, just like when we started to come up with this idea. Do either of you think that ZK Hack turned out the way you had expected it to be or the way we sort of originally conceived of it back then? So I, I guess for me, when we first started to talk about this concept of a ZK Hack, we were actually considering doing a full hackathon in person. But then, you know, COVID made things difficult and we actually sent out a feedback form to people to ask what people thought about doing an in-person event, whether they'd actually be able to participate in a hackathon in an active way and actually create something in a short time span. And a lot of the answers were saying that they're really interested in zero knowledge, but they actually don't think they would be able to necessarily build something in that time frame. So I guess from originally thinking, oh, in-person hackathon to kind of changing that idea slightly, it did evolve. But I think it's actually been more productive than doing a hackathon that people wouldn't be able to necessarily participate in fully. And this is kind of like a precursor to something else that might happen in the future. So of course, it's hard to compare like in-person events, but I still really value the benefit of it being virtual and it bringing together like a global community. So that doesn't totally answer your question, but I just want, because we've seen some really cool events, like virtual events come out of having to, you know, do things virtually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I joined the team once the idea was formed a bit already, but I just wanted to say like a massive shout out to the team because the amount of coordination behind the scenes uh, Susanna, Anna, and Kobe that required to put together a brand new event that you've never done before. And it lasts for at least seven weeks. <laughs> so, yeah, a huge feat. I mean, going back, something we didn't talk about so much in this episode so far was that kind of pre-planning and putting this together. I think we started back in August and our idea was let's do this seven weeks. Let's see how it works. Like in, in retrospect, I mean, I, I know I'm coming to it thinking seven weeks was a lot and I think it was really good, but I also think we, we pushed it. Like, I don't know if, if for future ZK hacks, if we need to do seven weeks again, I have this sense like we could probably accomplish something very similar in fewer weeks. Although I am, I am curious to hear from like the audience, if what they thought, like those people who did participate, if the seven, if the sort of cadence of like a slow week to week cadence, if that was right, or if they would have preferred something more dense. I think on that, like you said, um, the seven weeks, like maybe it was like from the puzzle perspective, because the leaderboard essentially stayed the same from about the fourth puzzle, I think. So that was just like a way we did the scoring. Maybe you need to change that for next time or something. Um, but like the top three, I think stayed the same from week four mm. uh so maybe this it's like one thing that suggests it was a little bit too long and i think people will um after having been through it once like us included will understand these puzzles like we saw by the end of it the last workshop which was the mina workshop which was huge community turnout people were asking for more puzzles oh, and yeah, so that's true yeah so i think now that everyone has kind of seen it in action, I don't know that there's many like puzzles like these that are, have been out in the wild yet. It'll be easier for people to jump in and learn and um, and there'll be a set of resources. I mean, we saw a lot of resources come together through this. In the Discord channel, we have mm -hmm. a bunch of people that put together study groups, um, paper reading groups, and just listing out resources. So I think this is a good foundation to help uh, hopefully the next one be even bigger. So what do you what do you both wish for for the future of CK Hack? I guess for the future it would be like open call to the community to get some feedback on components that we could possibly add to CK Hack, different yeah, because this was a complete brainstorm and experiment and we thought it went really well and I think we want to continue to improve on it and make it uh super useful to beginners, intermediate and advanced. Mm. What about you Susanna? I guess one of the like framings for having the length of the ZK hack was because we had so many parties that wanted to get involved, um, you know, like sponsors, people wanted to hold workshops. And I mean, I guess that's kind of a testament to the ZK community kind of thriving and being alive. And there's more teams that would want to get involved as well. Um, but 
was kind of constrained by the timings. So I guess in the future, you'd want to get the other teams that didn't get the opportunity to necessarily host a workshop or something to get them maybe more involved. I think I think when I look back on CK Hack, I think of it like it was a marathon, not a sprint. We had week to week. We had to kind of get our routine going. But I do think that like having done it once, I feel like going forward, we can be more creative. We have a lot of the material in place to do it again, too, which is great. And I know, I mean, my current thinking around it and obviously no promises, we don't know what the next year holds, but I do get the sense that we could do we could do something like this again, but next fall. But in the meantime, maybe we could do something smaller because uh, I think we have it somewhat set up to do more. And yeah, I did like the fact that, as you mentioned in the last session, there were people being like, when's the next puzzle? You were yeah. like, no more puzzles. <laughs> we are done. <laughs> yeah, I think that as well is like because we were bringing together communities from different projects, like sometimes maybe not everyone from those specific communities necessarily knew about the prior events. So for instance, that was like the people in MENA and the event was last. So I guess they just didn't necessarily know about the earlier events, but hopefully no. now they do know. And then, you know, in the future, they would actually be able to do the puzzles from start to finish. One last thing I want to ask you both is now we're wrapping up the year of ZK how do you feel about the community? You've both been working with me for at least six months. I think, Susanna, you were full time with working on Zero Knowledge Validator a little bit longer. But like, yeah, what, what do you feel reaching the end of this year? What does the ZK community look like to you? I mean, well, since I started in May, uh, I mean, that was like my first entry point into blockchain as well. I, I think it seems like each event that we've done, it's been kind of more vibrant and grown a bit in e each kind of event series that I've worked on. And I guess that's really encouraging in itself. At the same time, I feel like in September, October, there was kind of quite a lot of discussion around like layer two, ZK proofs for rollups, this kind of thing. And maybe that's encouraged the community to grow even more. But from like my perspective and looking at kind of attendance and how the Discord has grown, it it seems to be going in a positive direction and hopefully that continues into the new year. And you're even jumping in. You've like done some, you've done some of these workshops, haven't you? Uh, I, yeah. I mean, I, I followed along <laughs> with the, um, the Starknet one and I did a bit of the Mina one as well. Uh, nice. It's my basic coding skills. Um, but yeah. I'm happy to hear that too. Okay. Tanya, what about you? I mean, you've actually been in the space longer than just the time you've worked with me. But I know that now it's been much more of a focus on the zero knowledge community. So what what are you seeing as we roll kind of round out the year? Yeah, so before I was involved a bit in the ZK community through my work with Lease Authority, I got to learn about it. And now it's deep dive into ZK, which is really interesting. And I, it's what I really like about these very early stage communities. It's kind of the the scene where it's like everyone still knows everyone and I, I love that stage of communities and you see it, you just kind of feel a buzz that it's growing. I mean, I guess there's always growth when it's, you know, when it's still early stage. And I think, Anna, you've said like people have been saying for a while, like this is the year ZK, ZK. <laughs> and so maybe I'm a bit naive and I'm think, but I'm thinking this like, you know, that, it, that, it, the yeah, that yeah, there they, is something coming. Yeah. They, ha they have been saying that for a while. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you have been <laughs> weathered by the. I'm like, yeah, yeah it's, it's coming. <laughs> yeah. So, but me being like new to the deep dive into ZK and just how quickly it's grown. And and there are not only our events, but some other events and seeing the numbers of attendees at those events. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like there's a strong interest to learn. Cool. All right. Well, I want to say thank you to both of you for coming on the show. I want to say thank you for working on the ZK hack too. So we made it. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay. I want to say a big thank you to you, Tanya, the podcast producer, the podcast editor, Henrik, and I want to say thank you to all of our listeners and all of the ZK Hack participants. Uh, this is the last full episode of the year. We will be back in the new year. So yeah, thanks for listening. Bye.